you spoke, Marty, of you and Mr. Miscavige talking about Pat Broker and having an ongoing interest in Pat Broker. What came into play there in the years after he left the Sea Org? Well, Pat was an interesting fish because Miscavige, uh, all he was concerned about was getting materials that uh, Hubbard had written about the upper levels, Hubbard's PC folders, notes that he had done that Broker alluded to that were essential to compiling certain Scientology levels that hadn't been released and this sort of thing. Broker had been, been hiding these, using them as a last defense to prevent Miscavige from wiping him out from having any authority or influence in the church. This is all part of this power push against Broker. And once we had done, we had did this huge confrontation where I had brought in a number of PIs, security guys, you know, hired guns literally, to come in so Miscavige could have a direct confrontation with Broker. Uh, it was me, Will here, Starkey, all of his henchmen, all of Miscavige's henchmen came in and had a con and Miscavige had his confrontation with Broker and finally got Annie. Annie finally broke under the pressure and told Dave where Pat was storing the materials in a storage space. Well, once that, once the materials were gotten, Broker had no more cards to play, and he basically said, screw it, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. And um, he came directly to me, he said, Marty, you get on this guy, because I want to know every move he makes, you know, because of course his only concern was going to be Pat going public against him. So uh, I immediately set up a whole network of investigators, private investigators, to literally trace every step this guy made. Um, I had a private investigator befriend him. He, what happened was Pat went out and, and, and uh, initially lived with a, a woman who was a veterinarian for LRH's ranch. And I found out what his watering hole was through, um, through um, surveillance. And then I got a friendly old guy who was a retired cop go in there and sidle up and start buying drinks for Pat. Became friendly with him. You know, the guy was a good listener. Became a confidant. For Christmas, my investigator bought Pat a, a phone uh, that's a, a cordless, so it sends a radio signal from the headset back to the receiver. Because we had done some research and found out that you could uh, be several hundred yards away from the house, and if you had a police scanner or a radio scanner, you could pick up that signal. And um, Dave loved this idea. He wanted to hear as many conversations as he could with Pat, and we literally recorded all his conversations for probably a year period. We knew everything he was up to. Um, we knew where he was going to go to different places, and then we'd have teams of investigators follow him. And we had it down to the point where Dave really wanted me to get something on Pat so he could be, uh, have some insurance policy. I, you know, I, I feel bad about talking about the details of the guy's life. Suffice it to say, I don't want to go into details simply because, you know, it's bad enough that I did it. And how many private investigators worked on this case, well, if that's the right word for it? Okay. Well, I had the original operative, the agent, okay, and he was one guy that went on for several months, maybe a year, almost full-time working on him. And then I developed a team. I initially started off with, with probably four or five, you know, group of, of teams. But then we got down to his patterns down so well, I got it down to two guys who were really good at um, being able to handle it on their own. So we had two guys that were pretty much the team um, full time for between 89. Um, through 93 when I left Scientology initially the first time. So that entire period, those guys worked full time on him. They, they, they were on him all the time. He was in San Luis Obispo. They followed him literally when he moved to Colorado, when he moved briefly to Wyoming, back to Colorado, and finally, ultimately, uh, to uh, Eastern Europe, believe it or not. And um, that was going on up to 93 when I left. I went away for two years. I blew. I've told this story. I went for two years away for training on the free winds. I came back. When I came back, 
um, Miscavige started getting more, me more involved in external affairs again, all the copyright suits and all the other stuff that was going on, the McPherson case. So I learned from Mike Rinder at that time that, he, that Mike had picked it up after I'd left. So here we are three, four years later, it's still going on. Now, interestingly, I found out from Mike that as of when he left two years ago, Mike was, propo Mike was shocked to see, because he hadn't been down at OSA for so long, he had no idea it was still going on. Literally in 2007, 19 years, 18 years after I began that thing, those two guys were still on broker. Because Mike saw it in the, inter the Church's uh, Scientology International's budget, because Miscavige had instructed him, just on a whim, straighten that budget out. We're spending too much. So Mike went to this budget, and he saw they had, as of 2007, they still had those two guys on Pat Broker. 18, 19 years after the fact, and Mike said, well, I got this shouldn't be on here. I mean, how could we possibly still be interested? And struck it. Miscavige had his deputy, Warren McShane, come down and visit Mike, and he said, you out of your mind? You can't take that off of there. So, Joe, I have no reason to believe that to this day they've got the same investigators monitoring the same guy, which would be the 20th anniversary this year.